What would happen if a controller player with over 1,000 hours in Apex switched to keyboard and mouse for one month? Could I compete at the same level? How easy is it to aim when you have your whole arm? Does movement give MNK a significant advantage? Well, when Fiverr reached out to sponsor a video, I knew this was the perfect opportunity to answer my questions. Can a team of Apex coaches turn me into an MNK god in less than 30 days? Well, let's find out. Now, this wasn't my first time playing Apex on keyboard and mouse. In fact, it was the first input I played back when Apex came out, and for the time, I'd say I was pretty good. I even knew some movement like b-hopping, so I was confident I wouldn't be that bad. I mean, I'm an ALGS YouTuber, right? It's literally my job to study this game and be good at it. Well, things didn't really go as planned. Immediately, I noticed my aim was terrible, especially close-range tracking. I couldn't kill anyone, which was a big shock for a controller player that is used to getting those crispy one clips. My movement felt so stiff, and rigid. I can't even trying to simply slide, I would crouch in one spot and then slowly walk while continuously getting shot in the back. That is an example of how bad I am at this game. I kept hitting the wrong keys on the keyboard. And after day one and two, my best game was this 1000 damage two kill win, which I spent most of dead. And by the time my friend revived me, there was one player left in the lobby. I was so stupid. So it was time for some help. The plan was simple. I'd go to Fiverr and hire two coaches, one to help my aim and one to teach me insane movement tech. Cause what's an MNK player if you can't super glide? So I booked my sessions and on day three, I hopped in a call with Titan. Uh, we're gonna start off with like really basic stuff, but over time we're, we're gonna ramp up the actual spice. Titan is a full-time professional aim coach that has helped players hit the top rank in many FPS games like Apex, Valorant, CSGO, and Overwatch. He first measures your hand to help you find your perfect mouse. So, um, so so what mouse do you have right now? The the G Pro Super Light. So for your measurements, it's kind of a 50-50. Some people find it too wide. Some people find it perfect. What do you feel about it so far? Any complaints, really? No complaints too much. Yeah, for, I mean, dude, yeah, you're fine. We'll just keep it as it is. Okay. Then we hopped into Aim Labs to find my ideal sensitivity. Just play and I'll change your sensitivity for me. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I mean, okay, no, you know, you're good, you're good, you're good, but, but you are easy to read, so that's good, that's good. Okay, 1.25 is actually super common sensitivity. You can just see it like that? That's wild. Oh, yeah, I'll show you, I'll show you later. Yeah, this is good. You're basically fine. You know, good sensitivity will help, but you know, it's not going to make you walk on water. Uh, it is there to help make your training be a lot more efficient. Which okay. you'll see why very later on. Next, Titan had me go into some control and team deathmatch games so we can get an idea of how I play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm promise I'm, I'm definitely not one of those guys who <laughs> like, you know, like all the other Fiverr videos where they're like, no, guess what? I'm actually a pro player. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Something really interesting about Titan's approach is that he didn't try to immediately correct my mistakes. He took his time to analyze my strengths and weaknesses. Oh, yeah, it's all good, it's all good. Actually, we were casually talking the whole time I was playing, which was pretty chill, but I could tell that he was locked in the entire time to gather information to better instruct me later. Oh, okay. And that's when we got to the report. To the left is flicking, everything colored to the right is tracking. Yeah, your tracking is probably the weaker point of it for sure. If there's a guy who's just like like doing doing this type of weird thing, right? That is pretty tough, right? That's pretty tough for you. So smooth tracking, that's you know, this is your this is probably the absolute best thing that you're gonna track, right? So this is medium range. But you can think of this as anytime anyone at all goes straight okay. in any direction. <laughs> so for you'll probably track him perfectly here. But if he like does this weird thing where Whereas like he double jumps and does some weird stuff over here. You are not going to hit this. <laughs> like, so I would say number one, we're going to train is close range tracking. Uh, number two, we're going to train is the uh, readjusting, I would say. But more so erratic readjust. Uh, so micro flicking, I think is actually going to be genu genuinely useful when it comes to a game like Apex. Just because let's say you have a scout or let's say you have a wingman and you have a 2x. So micro flicking, think of this as outspeeding someone's erratic movement at a longer range. Let's say there's a rock right here, right? And someone picks out, shoots highs come out shoots highs come out shoots highs you also struggle against this from there bad. titan built out a fully customized aim labs routine focused on my three biggest weaknesses tracking erratic adjustments and sub micro flicking we went through a full run of the training pack and titan walked me through the most important things to keep in mind to achieve my goals so one important skill that you have to get good at is learning how to fluctuate your speed if you are currently not on the target then yeah activate it fast right but after you reach the general area, that's when I want you to slow down your speed back to medium. Right, so another error here, okay? Track, flick, right? The reason why you're very jaggedy when you're trying to track it smooth is because you're too preparatory when it comes to it switching its direction. 
And so because of that, every time you kind of jagger a little bit, it's because you're, you're kind of thinking, oh, he's switching now, he's switching now. Yeah. He's switching. Instead of that, I want you to flick as a reaction, right? If it just goes in one direction, assume it's going in that direction forever. Much better already. Much better. Really good. At this point, you're just failing, struggling to hit it because you're just not used to it, right? But again, this is fine, right? It's obviously, you're not going to do great at something you're just new at. And the final part was a seven-page document that had Titan's breakdown of my strengths and weaknesses, his whole philosophy about aim mechanics, and an in-depth daily training routine. Yeah, I mean, like, do you look great? Um, honestly, I was kind of like, when you were saying, like, oh, I came from, you know, I expected <laughs> way worse. I expected way worse me again. It was a full two-hour session. And now that I knew exactly what I needed to work on and how to work on it, I was anxious to get started. So on day four, I woke up bright and early and got right to work. For the routine, I had to run through the Aimlabs playlist twice, one time using various custom sensitivities suggested by Titan to train specific muscle groups that I was not comfortable with. The second time was to run through on my home sense, the one we picked together at the beginning of the session. But let's see how my aim is after my first time training. Okay. Well, I knew this was going to take some time. I mean, it wasn't all bad, and I was kind of happy that I wasn't that good, because I mean, the only direction from here was up, right? Now, Titan suggested that I hop into 20 minutes of mixtape and then spend the rest of my time in standard BR game modes. Here's the thing, though, because I still felt my aim and tracking were weak, the task of dropping into Battle Royale, which has a million other things to be worried about, was daunting. And when I started the challenge, I found myself sitting in the lobby more often than playing, so I felt it would be best to stick to mixtape for the first few days. And you'll see in a bit how this absolutely backfires on me. Just keep camping, my guy. Over the next three days, I drilled this routine into wake up, Apex Legend. Aim train, play Apex. I wanted to hit a satisfying one clip so bad. I felt my aim was improving and I was getting more used to the feeling of a mouse. This thing's so much easier to use on keyboard mouse instead of from controller. Okay. Ooh. Whoa, let's go. 84%? Give me that. But something about my gameplay still felt off. The best way I could describe it is it was clunky and slow. It was my movement. So I went back to Fiverr and found Goose. The highlight video of his movement really caught my attention. Seeing the advanced tech he knew and I've always wanted to achieve. And day seven commenced the journey yeah. of improving my movement. All right, well, typically what I like to do is I kind of just like to go over wall bounces first and kind of just see like what their like pre-existing knowledge is. So you want me to just start wall bouncing here? All right, not gonna lie. When he asked me to do wall jumps, I got skeptical. Wall jumps are the most basic basic movement mechanic, and even though I was fairly new to keyboard and mouse, I thought I had a pretty good grasp on them. And man, was I humbled quick. Is when you're doing like wall bounces and stuff, set it up as like a wall run. Like basically like this is what's gonna look like. You wanna hold the opposite directional key. So for example, the wall is on the left, so I'll be holding the D directional key, facing the wall and looking slightly behind me. You just have a lot of grip on the wall. Like you're I never realized how in depth something like wall jumping could be. And who started by teaching me the most effective ways to hit them. He was extremely patient and never judged me for how much I lacked in skill. <laughs> Who thought the slide jump was going to be the thing that I... <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's the case a lot of the time. Goose realized that I was holding W every time I went to wall jump, and as soon as he told me to stop doing that... There you go. Okay. I'll talk. There you go. You try to hit it uh, the, the other way, too. That's all movement is. It's just like a rhythm and a feeling for it. One thing I really wanted to get out of the session, though, was learning how to change directions in midair. Yeah, as most of you know, tap strafing. And if you tap strafe out of that, you can like you can land like by these sandbags too. Like you're gonna need to learn how to tap strafe. How do we do that? <laughs> oh, like tap strafe out of the wall bounce? How do you just tap strafe in general? That's probably like one thing oh, I haven't like ever actually learned yet. Really, dude? Okay, I got you. Tap strafing is very simple. Like what you just learned right now is harder than tap strafing, like inherently. Oh, no way. You want to slide jump, hold A, gradually like move your mouse to the left so for you it's like scroll down to jump so scroll down then immediately after you want to be scrolling down the whole time and keep those w inputs like locked in the entire time you're trying to like do the air strafe what is your uh, sensitivity by the way okay okay there you go yeah that's, that's even better you, you should try to do a tap strafe 180 like slide jump and then after you slide jump tap strafe 180 to the right so i hold d and then just jump after you slide jump and then scroll down like as you're turning around there you go. I can tell Goose That's really had good. a passion for this. He'd gas me up whenever I hit new tech for the first time. 
Oh, there you go. That was chapter 180. I can't even tell if I'm doing it, <laughs> to be honest. That's hilarious. Yeah. And even shared no, this I with me. I really enjoyed doing this. Like, it was like so nostalgic for me to like, to see people learning movement for the first time and like, they're getting all hype. Like, oh my God, super glide. Like, I never thought. This is so cool. After top strafing, we went into fatigue jumps. Go, boom. Oh my. Oh. <laughs> There you oh, go. Let's it. go. Got it. <laughs> My boy. Like barely hold. Yeah, there you go. Boom. Just like that. Yeah. Dude, nice. Oh, let's do it. Yo, let's go. <laughs> go, go. Zipline tech. Oh, okay. And of course, the coveted super glide. After Goose explained the way that he super glides, I went through tons of failed attempts. Okay. Okay. So a little bit earlier than that. Okay. Still okay. A little bit. No, a little bit sooner than that last one. Okay, a little bit sooner. A little bit sooner. Okay, okay, a little, a little bit later, a little bit later. <laughs> but after about 30 minutes of trying. Until, until it's time to super glide, then I let go of space and see. Oh, yes! That it? <laughs> you just did it! Dude, I'm gonna watch that footage back a hundred times now. Dude, let's oh, go. Oh, there we go. Yes, okay. and another one, and another <laughs> one. There We're you go, dude, dude. Let's go, dude. I knew it, dude. I knew oh. it. I booked for one hour, but Goose went above and beyond, and we trained for almost two hours. We only stopped because I had to go. If you want to book sessions with any of the coaches in the video, their links are in the description description below and code Jumba will get you 10% off any purchases on Fiverr. It also directly supports me, so it'd be much appreciated. Now on day eight, I added at least 30 minutes of movement training in the firing range to my daily routine. But Goose's number one suggestion was to just constantly try movement techniques while playing the actual game modes. Immediately after the coaching session, I was feeling more confident. Remembering and practicing what Goose taught me had me feeling a lot more smooth. From the aim labs practice, I could tell that my mouse control was becoming more stable. Okay, I didn't say I was that good yet, but I was even getting better with tech we didn't talk about, like B-Hop healing. I was still mostly playing mixtape game modes because I wasn't 100% ready yet. But on day 10, I did something amazing. Okay, if you're experienced with movement, this probably isn't amazing at all. But escaping this fight by hitting a 180 tap strafe off a jump pad when I was low HP was wild to me. Yeah, I messed up the second tap strafe, but this had me feeling great. So finally, I felt ready to hop into the Battle Royale game mode. It was perfect. King's Canyon had been brought back into rotation. The first Apex map I ever played five years ago before I was even a controller player. I dropped at my favorite landing spot from that era and realized, okay, no one drops here. It took some time to find enemies, and when I did, I found myself in long range fights rather than the up close fights I had been practicing in mixtape. So I tried to be aggressive and close the gap, but enemies just kept running away. And finally, when I got in close, I started to put in work. I could feel the training had been paying off and literally could see the situations that Aim Labs led to. I noticed that when that Pathfinder zipped away, his teammate didn't go with him. So this was my opportunity to push and have a 1v1 situation. I managed to pick up the kill, but I ended up getting pinned outside the zone by two squads holding the edge. I helped full kill one squad and went for the red armor swap, but I was so slow and I had a newfound issue. I didn't know how to close the menu. I just tried to run till it was off my screen. But by that time, the second duo pushed me and wiped me. Remember when I said playing only mixtape would back? fire on me? Well, I didn't have to learn to armor swap because in mixtape, you don't need to loot death boxes. And that's not where the bad habits from mixtape ended. I was way too overconfident in fighting because I usually had three to nine teammates to help pull the enemy's attention away. Like in this situation, I have less than 100 HP and I decide to re-peak a duo. Also, I found myself taking way too much damage because I was used to having unlimited batteries. And in mixtape, I could choose the gun I wanted. They always came with at least blue attachments and I could change the scope. Have you noticed I've been using a lot of Bangalore? Well, my goal was to use her smokes to disable the aim assist of control older players. I mean, that's what pros do and why she has the highest ALGS pick rate, right? Well, in mixtape, that was fine because I could always give myself a digi threat. But in BR, it wasn't working because, well, I never had a digi. I was having a tough time breaking these habits. Over and over, I kept dying without fighting very much. I finally decided to stop doing no fill and get teammates. And while it helped a bit... It didn't matter much when they immediately left the game. They might be watching you. What? He 
insta left two on top of it. Getting overwhelmed and feeling like I was permanently on tilt, I wasn't sure what to do. And that's when I thought, well, I hired a name coach, I hired a movement coach, how about I get one more for general game sets? And suddenly I recognized the name Pubski. I was pretty sure this guy tried to compete in ALGS in the past, so I went to Twitter and I was right. Challenger circuit and LCQ finalist. Plus he was the number two arenas predator. That seemed pretty good for me. So I sent over a couple of VODs I gathered while playing and on day 15, hopped into my third coaching session with Pubski. All right. You ready to just get everything started? Now, Pubski's session was a 90-minute VOD review, and I asked him to mostly cover my positioning in fights. Jump on him. We have him so low. So jumping on him, it's not necessarily like a bad play. I guess a risky play. We have no idea how much health he has, right? Rather than, you know, just jumping straight on his head, you could like fall down, zip to the side, try and fight him from like one of these angles because this would be quote unquote like high ground. Um, it'd be hard for him to push you because even if he out trades you, he's going to have to run climb up. Jumping on his head, it's like a fair fight, which isn't bad. You know, it's, it's fair. Um, but why take a fair fight when you have the advantage in it? And so you play, hit fire is good. And so when you're fighting this close of a range, you definitely want to be hit firing. Mm -hmm. um, good shots, good shots. <laughs> okay, so right here, you, yeah. you ran out and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> this is so risky. Great confidence, you know, you're looking you're looking for the fight that you're not full health. 25 shield, and then we have, say, maybe like 40, 30 health, right? So we have less than 100 health total. If you really wanted to fight, say, like, look for the swap in here, and a safer option would sort of, you can sort of just, like, play by these these double doors right here. I'm so used to just sending it, and I'm not going to miss shots out there. And then, like, I, I get it. <laughs> It starts to go down south a little bit. This is sort of like like a team problem. And I know you're like solo queuing, but getting separated. And the problem is like everyone's getting picked off one by one by one. And your lifeline goes that way towards the Pathfinder. And then you go that way. Mm -hmm. So now you guys are doing two different things. So right now your Pathfinder dies alone. Your lifeline's gonna run off alone. And then you're gonna run off alone. And what went wrong in terms of communication? Why did we do this? How do we get split? What can we do next time to fix it? If you're just playing with random people and you know, then you're sort of just mainly focused on yourself. Like, was there anything I can do to support my teammate? Maybe be there faster to help them. Maybe if I could communicate with them and be like, <laughs> I really got to get out of here. I can't <laughs> fight. These were the exact reminders that I needed. Pubski then sent me an overview of the most important things to work on, including avoiding taking fair 50-50 fights, communicate with and play more for my teammates, and watching my health when pushing. Day 16, I did my training routine. Quick apex warm-up and right into trios. Immediately in my first game, I almost 1v3 this entire squad. Yes, I got stuck in a death box again, but I now knew to just hit tab. As much as I'm freaking out about that, almost clutching it out had me impressed with myself and excited to hop right back in. And in my next game, we hot dropped back in Fragment, and I started off pretty hot. I even started to put some of the zipline movement tech that Goose taught me to work here. Since I was still better with flicking than tracking, going for shotguns was helping me put out more damage and pick up more kills. Getting four kills and wiping two squads this quick was a great feeling, especially considering most of my BR games, I died during the first fight. As we were rotating out of Fragment, our Rampart got caught by a squad and goes down, and I managed to get in there and pick up two of the three enemies. We full wipe them, but that's when a third party comes in fast. Seeing my teammate knocks one and makes it a 2v2, I tried to get right back in there. But these Nessies were all over me, and I'm pretty sure that one blocked the final shot that would have knocked the Gibby. These damn things even thirsted me. But I was feeling great with six kills being my new highest, and suddenly I felt like a good game was now possible. The next day, however, those Nessies were enough for me to just queue up duos and not worry about the RNG in the Final Fantasy event. And on day 17, things were getting even better. I started this game off getting downed in a 1v2, and I was about to quit, but I noticed my teammate had a mic, and he didn't just run off. I could tell he was gonna get my banner, and if I was gonna get upset about people leaving, I had to not be like every other player. He pulled the res, and that caused enemies to push us, but my aim was finally getting nice, 
and I was able to help hold them back by putting out some good damage. We managed to fight our way through and take out most of the players in the area. Oh. I downed an enemy. Dying to the ring? Bro, what? Yeah, I had a feeling they were wrapping around. I was just trying to follow his lead, calm damage numbers, and be a good teammate. Hit one for 100. And as we try to enter the lava fisher zone, we walk up on a team holding the edge. I hear the lifeline walk up behind me and I get good entry damage, but I see my wraith push the octane instead. In this moment, I remember that time I split from my teammate and we took two 1v1s. I remember the advice Pubsky gave me and quickly decided to gravity lift to my wraith and take out the octane. I got the octane. Lifeline on me. Got it. After my teammate hit this Kraber shot, it was yeah. just a matter of cleaning up the final two solos. My bad, I definitely oh, you're good. Oh, nice okay. shot. GG's. And I had my first win. After this, it was just rinse and repeat till I got the games I was looking for. I felt that a 3k and at least 10 kills would be a good goal for it by the end of the challenge. 1 HP. In AIM Labs, I wasn't breaking my records as often, but I was getting much more consistent with higher scores, especially in tracking tasks, which I could tell were really starting to pay off. I was winning more fights, putting out more damage. All dead, all dead. I was actually making useful comms. I stuck her, I stuck her. I knock, knock, knock. I'm gonna go for the finish, I'll come back. And winning more games. I see him. He's, he's crouching in a corner. GG's man, GG's. And suddenly I realized how much I was enjoying Apex through this whole challenge. Since I started making ALGS videos, I haven't really had the time to play much. And when I did, it often felt stale. So trying out a new input was really revitalizing my passion for the game. I found myself waking up every day and actually wanting to play. The only problem I was really running into now is that the lobbies were dying out way too fast. Like take this game here. Round one hasn't even closed yet. And there's only 16 people left in the lobby. I wasn't sure how I was going to show off a high damage game if there was never anyone to shoot. I was running out of time with the challenge. And with Pro League starting back up, it meant I had less time to game during the day as more of my time had to be focused on keeping up with that and that's when apex brought it back this is quite possibly the best game mode apex has ever released if you've never heard of three strikes before it's a game mode where your team has three lives per game you can't be full killed when getting knocked and revives are super quick to pull off it solves a lot of problems with Apex Pups, as lobbies play out longer, more teams are in endgame, and your teammates have more reason to stick around and not Safe on me. It's also total mayhem and constant fighting. Not. I knew three strikes was really going to help me show off what I had been practicing for the last month. And on day 28, I finally got a game I felt proud about. I got one, I got one. Yeah, the other team still had a life. I was even pretty good at armor swapping finally. But unfortunately, with the nature of the game, even though we took out this squad, they had one more life to drop in and pinch us inside the building. Oh, there's just so much. They, they thirded us. Have a good one. It was nice to meet you guys. What, did you see that spray transfer? Let's watch it again. Now in slow mode. Oh yeah, that was nice. And then on day 30, the last day for the challenge, this is the game where I truly felt I showed the significant improvement in my tracking, flicking, and overall gameplay. This game made me realize that after one month, if I keep up the daily practice and routine, I wouldn't be far from where I was on Roller. Now this was a bugged storm point game, which meant the game didn't end after round three circle closed, but it caused teams in the server to just continuously drop on us over and over. And compared to where I started the challenge, being able to hold my own here was a big difference. Nice. Unfortunately, we ended up on our last life. I make this push here that gets us killed and we get fully eliminated. 
And for the last day of the challenge, I thought I was happy with 2,700 damage. But you probably noticed this video has some time left. You see, as much as that was a solid game to show off my progress, I had this nagging feeling inside that it wasn't enough. That I had so much more to offer and I couldn't just leave you guys with a five kill loss. So I gave it one more day. In this game, my team dropped mill and looted up rather than just pot dropping right away, which helped a lot in three strikes where ammo is so scarce. I didn't think much would happen this game. I was even on the phone at the beginning, but after we won these two back-to-back -back fights, I realized we might have a game here, so I started focusing up. I hit one for 183. We got caught on the edge and tried to evac forward, but me and the horizon didn't get to fly before the balloon got shot out. We tried to wrap in the zone, but for some reason, I thought when I heard this ping, it meant my horizon went down and I'd have to win this fight now. Oh, I thought you got downed. So we lose our first life, but it's okay because we had two more. Now, while you watch me in peak MNK form, absolutely shredding this team in front of me, I want to one last time thank Fiverr for sponsoring the video. Going through the three coaching sessions was ridiculously fun, and I don't think I would have made this progress nearly as fast without them. All three coaches are linked below. If you do use them, tell them Jumba sent you and use code Jumba to get 10% off. That's also any purchases, not just the coaching sessions. Right like I have some funds left over on my account and I'm gonna be using them to get some emotes for my stream design. Now we actually lost our second life pretty quick and we are down to our last. So now we really needed to lock it in. I couldn't believe how well I was tracking in close ranges. Again, I'm not any pro, but to know where I started, this felt amazing. And after this fight, my confidence was at like an all-time high. I felt like I could take on the whole lobby, and that's just what my team did. We encountered some issues though. We were running out of meds and ammo, and even as Loba, none was left on the ground. We had to play more aggressive to finish fights, loot death boxes, and we were pushing everything. Our Wraith called for a push on this team that was shooting us in the back, and we got some really unlucky timing with these arc stars. Here's the wingman. He's coming down the Wraith. Oh! That's not cool. The Archers. I'll block this. With two of us going down and no more lives left, I thought the game was over here. So I'm at the fly back on. Just, yeah, yeah, just take time. But our Wraith managed to escape, and I wasn't going to just give up like that. This enemy team seemed really afraid and let our Wraith live, so I crawled across the entire compound so he could get the reset. Oh no, not the sniper. Over Race shit on so bad. Oh my god. Yes. Cracked one on the roof. I'm good. Okay, we gotta kill this. We gotta push now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay, pushing. I'm on me, on me. I think the other team's walling over. Almost cracked, almost cracked. Nice, let's go. That was sick. <laughs> At the fight, the gauntlet there. 12 kills, 5,300 damage, 22 knocks. I know it was a bugged game that went for 35 minutes, but from where I started, yeah, that one felt good.